Take your Bibles this morning and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 19. Going to be looking at uh, this next uh, passage here in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 4, 12 to 19. I want you to find that in your Bibles in, in whatever way that you have God's Word with you this morning. And we'll be sharing in that passage together in just a moment. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 19. Now, while you're finding that, uh, two things that I want to celebrate with you this morning and give thanks to God for you. One is the amazing group of volunteers that blanketed our city yesterday with egg hunts. Uh, we had four different locations for our Easter egg hunts this year. And I got to tell you, you responded amazingly uh, with this call for volunteers and call for eggs. Uh, Anne Marie put out a call for eggs, and uh, I don't know, maybe it's just the nature of eggs, but they just multiplied and multiplied. And, and Anne Marie's office would just fill with eggs, and, and overnight, you know, she would leave and she would come back, and there would be more eggs there, you know. And after a while, I said, Anne Marie, don't turn out the light or shut the door. Just leave them alone, you know. Don't, don't encourage anything because they would just multiply. Thousands and thousands of eggs, but even more importantly, you responded to volunteer, and the gospel was shared yesterday. Amen. Uh, the, the, the group that I participated in, uh, we, 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 Megan and Rusty Watkins shared the gospel with that group, and they did just a fantastic job uh, with that, and we were so grateful for that. And I'm hearing great reports from all over our community about the lives that we were able to touch with the gospel and to make connections with our church. Uh, folks that attended, we, we just asked them to fill out just a brief registration card, and for everyone that does not have a church home, we'll be following up up with them as well. But thank you again for all the ways that you responded, whether it was with eggs or helping out or simply praying for those events. We go out to our community to share the gospel with people. It is a holy event. It's holy ground when you share the gospel. And uh, it happened a bunch of times yesterday, and we're very grateful for that. Now, one thing that you can do, um, we had cards that we uh, gave out to families who uh, came to the egg hunt, and I asked Anne Marie to make sure that we had extras because it is a great way to invite someone to church next Sunday. Uh, you might say, well, it's Easter Sunday. Won't we have a full house? Well, I pray to God we'll have the sanctuary filled on Easter Sunday. But we take nothing for granted, and we always take every opportunity to invite someone to church because when they come to church, as we pray, God will open their hearts to hear the gospel and to receive. It's one of the ways that people can come into the kingdom. Not the only way, but it's one of the ways. So we've got these cards available. We've got some up here at the, uh, at the front. We also have some spare uh, copies in the pews. I even managed to put some up there in the balcony. As you go down the steps over here on the organ side, I did put a stack up there. If they're all gone, praise God, they're all gone, and that's great. Uh, but I want you to take these and share these with someone. Uh, tack it up uh, at your workplace, share it with a neighbor, share it with a friend, family member, but it simply says, come and join us for worship next Sunday here at Campbellsville Baptist Church. Bible study at 915, worship at 1030. And then on the other side of the card is a great rundown of all of the great children and family activities that we'll be having this summer. So it does double duty, uh, but use it as a way to invite someone to join you in worship next Easter Sunday. So you'll find them in the pews. Uh, if there's if everyone has taken one on your pew and if you need still some extras, let us know and we'll make sure we get those cards to you. But thank you for being a church willing to volunteer to take the gospel out into our community. Now, second group that I want to recognize and give the Lord thanks for, uh, and that is the work group that did an outstanding job on the church directory. If you have seen the church directory, and if you are so thankful for the, for the great uh, outcome that this project is, would you just join me in, in thanking the Lord uh, together? And, and, and I want to recognize the chair of the work group, Kathy Pavey, Kathy, yes. Now, Kathy had a great group of folks that worked with her but, but by recognizing Kathy, I want to recognize the entire group. So, Kathy, if you'll come, and I want to present you with a very special copy of the directory. All right. 
Uh, and listen, I- I- if you're here this morning, we also want to recognize you, Charity Powell. If you will stand and remain standing. All right, there's Charity and Carrie Gaddis. There's Carrie. And also Robert Bender. Robert? Okay, there's Robert. Remain standing. Don't sit down yet. Paul Osborne. Paul. There's Paul. And uh, Terry Brewer. There's Terry. All right. If you will join me in thanking this great group of folks. Amen. Okay. Thank you. You may be seated. And again, thank you, Kathy. Wonderful job. All right. This directory will do us well for the next, uh, next two years, maybe five years. Who knows? Yeah, five years. All right. Good. That's usually the shelf life on a directory. Great. Wonderful. All right, and then we're making these available at the end of the service. If you don't have yours yet, you can go to uh, the back entrance at the covered drive, and we are making the uh, directories available there. If you, if you had your picture taken, you get a free copy. Um, if you didn't get your picture taken, if you still want a copy, we do have extras available for $5 a piece, and that $5 goes to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Or if you simply would like an extra copy, $5 again Uh, goes to Annie Armstrong, and you have a copy of the directory. Uh, Again, very, very pleased with how that worked out. All right, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 19. If you'll have that open in your Bibles, stand together, please. Follow along as I read the passage aloud. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 19. Beloved, Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. So we've been looking together at this letter of 1 Peter, and we've been reminded of the great theme of 1 Peter. 1 Peter is all about hope. That's the great theme. And it's reminded us of the three great things that we have from God. We have faith, we have love, but we also have hope. And remember, it's hope that changes us. It's hope that transforms us. And if you have hope, you can endure. If you have hope, you can persevere. And it's hope that changes you. It affects your attitude, your character, your motivations. It takes root deep in your soul, and it gives you the power for the glory of God to keep doing the things that God has called you to do. Now, if you don't have hope, you really can't do it. If you don't have hope, you don't have that power. You can't key in on what God has already done for you and what he has promised yet to do for you. Hope is indispensable. But the great message of 1 Peter is that we do have hope. And it's all based in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of what he has already done, there is no doubt that God loves us. But then what we have still been promised to experience because of Jesus Christ, great deliverance and great glory, we have that in the Lord Jesus Christ because of his gospel. So because of Christ, we have hope. And that's changes the equation. So hope is this. Hope is our confidence in Christ that God is working all things for good. Now you may find yourself even this morning in a life situation that is difficult, maybe even a trial. You might even call it suffering of some form or another. And perhaps you've come to church wondering this morning, what is God up to? 
Why is he allowing this? Why is he permitting this? I prayed that God would end it, but he hasn't yet. What is happening? What is going on? Well, friend, you need hope. But if you've got Christ, you've got it. That confidence that no matter what, God is working all things for good. That's the great theme of First Peter. Now, we've already talked about the fact that the, the people that Peter is writing to in the first century were beginning to suffer intense persecution for their faith. So because they were calling upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and specifically for that reason, they were losing their homes, their jobs, their possessions, their livelihoods. In fact, Peter calls them sojourners and exiles because they have been, they've been outcasts from their own people. But in the midst of all that, Peter says, have hope. God is working all things for your good because you have Christ. But this morning, here in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19, Peter focuses in on one particular experience that you and I have from time to time in our walk with the Lord. And it can only best be described as that time of testing or that time of trial when we realize that through things that are happening to us in life and how we are praying to God about it, we have entered into some sort of a test, a test of our faith, a test of our convictions, a test of the truth that we know, a test of our commitment, but it's a time of test and it's a time of trial. Peter tells us that when you have hope, you will not only make it through that time of testing, but you will even pass that time of testing. Because we have hope in Christ, we can pass the tests of life. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. To pass the tests of life, what does it mean? So if you are undergoing some sort of a trial right now, let these words be God's truth and God's encouragement for you. Or perhaps you can understand these words and even jot down some notes in your Bible or in your bulletin this morning and hold on to it. Because it's either one or the other. Either you are undergoing a test of your faith or you soon will be. And we'll talk about that too in just a second. But take a look. What does it mean to pass the tests of life? Well, Peter talks to us about a couple things. First of all, Peter says this, prepare. Prepare to undergo a test in life. Now remember, or notice what Peter says here at the beginning of our passage there in verse 12. Uh, you know, I, I love Peter. I love his pastor's heart because at the end of verse 11, you think he's done, right? We looked at these verses last week. At the end of verse 11, he's, he gives this great doxology. He talks about God being glorified through Jesus Christ to him build on glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Okay, we're done, right? No, we're not done. The pastor that is Peter says in verse 12, Beloved, loved ones, brothers and sisters in Christ, I can't close out my letter until I tell you one more thing that's so important. Beloved, look at verse 12. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And folks, this is where it starts when the test comes. And, you know, Peter calls it the fiery trial, right? And, and whatever that is, whatever that means. Now, for the believers in Peter's day, it meant a certain kind of trial. For you and I, it means something else of, of a similar vein, but the circumstances could change. But whatever it is, you and I would call it a fiery trial. Not just any trial, but a fiery trial. And Peter says, don't be surprised. Don't, don't be perplexed about this. Don't scratch and say, you know, where, where did this come from? What is God up to? Is he still in control? Why is he allowing this? Why is he permitting this? This is hard. This is a fire. Don't be surprised, Peter says, as though something strange were happening to you. Part of being prepared is to understand that the times of trial and testing will come and they do come. And this is why I love spending time around people who have been walking with the Lord a lot longer than I have. Because this is one of the things that they can tell us. They, they can tell us that the trials do come. 
and they can be fiery, and they can be intense, but it's not a question of if they come, but just that they will come. Whether it have to do with, with a relationship or our finances, or your job, or your family, or even something having to do with church or your profession of faith in Christ, or maybe, maybe, your fiery trial is the fact that people know that you're a Christian, and they insult you, they, they, they make fun of you because of it, and it gets so hard to keep on following Christ. And you say, God, why, do, why is this going on? Can't you make it stop? Can't you make them stop? Don't be, don't be surprised. Don't be perplexed as though something strange were happening to you. Remember, remember that Jesus himself had his test. Jesus himself had his trials. It's one of the first things that happens to Jesus after he's baptized. He comes up out of the water, right? Spirit of God descends upon him. The heavenly voices, beloved, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. That's awesome, that's great. But the very next thing that happens, in fact, the Gospel of Mark says this, the Spirit of God compels Jesus to go into the desert. And while he's in the desert, he is directly tempted and assaulted and assailed by Satan himself after 40 days of fasting, a time of testing, and a time of trial. And you can go on from there. That wasn't the only time it happened. The, the disciples wouldn't understand. Peter himself would, 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 wouldn't understand what Jesus was up to. And then even in the Garden of Gethsemane, that severe trial that Jesus persevered through and that he experienced, he said, God, if there's any other way, please let this cup pass from me. And then to realize that his three closest friends couldn't even stay awake. Yeah. Jesus went through this too. And because he did, we do. And, and it's 1 Peter is the book where we get that great verse where it says, you and I are walking in his very footsteps. W what are the words that you hated to hear when you were in school? The, the, the two words I hated to hear when I was in school were pop quiz, right? You dreaded that, pop quiz. A quiz you weren't ready for, a quiz you weren't prepared for. Don't let this happen to the most important tests of life. When they come, you, you may not know exactly when or through this circumstance, but when they come, don't be surprised. This is how you prepare. But secondly, to pass the tests of life because of your hope in Christ, praise. Sounds weird, sounds so strange, right? I'm going through a test and a trial, and Pastor Mike, you're telling me that I ought to praise God? I ought to praise him and worship him? What sense does that make? Let Peter explain. Verse 13. Okay, there he says it in verse 13. But rejoice, rejoice, insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Verse 14. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now there's something to this. And, and, and Peter explains it. James talks about it. James says that we could count up all joy when we undergo trials and, 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 and tests and so forth. So it's not the only time where you find this in the scripture. But notice what Peter says about it. He says, when you go through a trial or a test, don't be surprised, but rather rejoice. And Peter gives us two reasons why we can rejoice. And the first one is this. You can rejoice because you know that if you are suffering the consequences for calling Jesus as Lord right now, that it's one of the ways that God has of assuring you that you will one day stand in his glorious presence. It's one of the ways that you and I have of being assured of our salvation. Because folks, i got to say this to you. If you go through your entire Christian experience, and if you never ever have to pay any sort of a price for calling Jesus as Lord, what kind of witness do you have? What kind of Christian experience do you have if you've never ever had to pay the price? But on the other hand, if you have, 
then you know exactly what Peter is talking about. And you say, you know what, why would I go through this? Why, why would I submit myself to this? Well, the reason is because I call Jesus Lord. And if he walked this path, I walk this path. And if I share in his sufferings now, then it's the Lord's assurance that one day I will glory in his presence. And I love how Peter puts it. It's like, it's like words fail him almost, but I love this at the end of verse 13 so that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. How many times do we wrestle with assurance? Am I really saved? Am am, am I really a Christian? I thought I was, now I'm not so sure. I, I, I was baptized when I was a child, but am I really a Christian? One of the ways you can be sure is when you are tested and you remain strong and true. You know that one day you'll stand in his presence. That's one reason why you can praise God. It's his assurance, right? But then there's something else here as well. Peter says that when you are insulted because you're a Christian, not only is it a blessing that you are anticipating, but there is a particular kind of blessing that you can know right now. What does he say? In verse verse 14, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, look at this in verse 14, you are blessed right now. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now, Peter doesn't talk in the future here. He doesn't say this is something that will happen. He says right now. The spirit of God and the spirit of glory is resting upon you. Now, there are two things that that, that came to my mind when I was working through the passage this week, and the first one was this. Remember in the Old Testament when the Israelites would, would move through the desert and they'd camp out in tents? And the, 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 the presence of God would rest upon the tabernacle, and it was that pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And how cool that must have been. There was no doubt and no question that God's presence was with them. There was no doubt about what he wanted them to do because it was all about that visible manifestation of God's glory that was always there. The Shekinah glory of God. I think that's what Peter's talking about here. Do you want to know what the Shekinah glory of God is all about? To know that his presence is resting upon you? What does that feel like? You endure insults for Jesus Christ, and you'll begin to know what that's like. A particular blessing. The spirit of glory and the spirit of God rests upon you. There's the Old Testament picture, but also I'm thinking about when Jesus was baptized, right? He comes up out of the water. What does the Bible say? The Spirit of God descends like a dove and rests upon him. And then the the, the voice says, the voice says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Well, that, 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 that was a Jesus God thing. That was a God the Father, God the Son thing. Listen, you endure insults for Jesus. And you can get some of that too. The Spirit of glory and the Spirit of God will rest. That is a present blessing that you can only have if you are willing to pay the price and endure the test. So you prepare and you praise all because of your hope in Christ. Something else that you can do. You can also purify. Understanding this, the reason why God allows the tests, the purpose under God's sovereign plan for our lives, Peter even tells us about that. Because there's something about our lives being purified before the Lord. Now take a look at what he says. Verse 15. I, I, really, I love verse 15. Because, you know, Peter's talking about suffering for the Lord, right? And, you know, and if we're not careful, if we're not careful, sometimes we can humble brag. You ever know, you ever know somebody that humble brags? You know, you know what a humble brag is? You know? You're, you're saying something that, that's supposed to be kind of humble, but at the same time, you're kind of building yourself up, you know? Oh, you know, I, I, really, I really struggle getting out of bed to go down and feed the homeless today. And that, that's a humble brag, okay? So, so if we're not careful, we can humble brag about suffering. We can humble brag about paying the price for the Lord. And, and I do it. You do it. We all do it. But it's not right, okay? It's not right to humble brag. But notice what a true test from the Lord can do. A true test can help purify you. Now notice what Peter says about this. Verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers, oh wait a minute, I'm sorry, back up, verse 15. Verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief 
or an evildoer or as a meddler. In other words, check your motivation. Are you suffering for Christ or are you suffering because of the consequences of your sinful behavior? Because either way, suffering happens. And the way that God has, has put together our world in his infinite wisdom and the way he's woven things together, folks, when we sin, we suffer. We suffer the consequences. And praise God, we can be forgiven, but we'll still suffer the consequences. So Peter says, you know what? If you're suffering right now, if you're undergoing a test, make sure that God can purify your heart and your motives. Murderer, not that one. Thief, no, don't think so, but wait a minute. Peter also says, are you suffering because you're an evildoer or a meddler? Oh, that one hurts, okay. <laughs> a meddler? The, the word Peter uses means somebody who gets in other people's business, tries to figure it out for them and let them know. Meddling in someone else's affairs? Consequences come. So Peter, you know what? If you're suffering, just check your, check your heart, check your life. And the test can reveal that, and the test can help purify your spirit and your heart and make you better before the Lord. But then there's this, and this is an even more serious matter that testing can purify. Verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, and, and Peter uses the very word here, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Folks, one of the most serious ramifications happen when we are ashamed of Christ and when we are ashamed to be called a Christian because Jesus himself said, and we take none of these words lightly, Jesus himself said, if you are ashamed of me in this present generation, Jesus said, when I come again, I'll be ashamed of you. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but that makes me stop in my tracks. And I have to ask myself, am I ever ashamed to be a Christian? Am I ashamed to where sometimes if I'm introducing someone to, some, someone to me, I, I say, well, maybe I shouldn't say I'm a pastor. Maybe I'll say I'm something else. What's going on there? Am I ashamed of my calling? Am I ashamed of my church? God forbid. But you see, this is what testing can do. It can purify us. Let none of us ever be ashamed to be called a Christian be called a part of his kingdom and to call Jesus as Lord. A test will help to purify us. Uh, Malachi says these words. Listen to what Malachi says about the, the purification of testing. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. And then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. That's Malachi 3, 1 through 4. Listen, we want to worship God in righteousness. We want to offer him sacrifices that he will love and he will be blessed with. But it happens when we let him purify us. And that's what tests do. To pass the tests of life, finally, you and I persevere. This is a test like no other. It's not a question of having the right answers. It's not a question of marks on a page being marked correct or incorrect. It's not a question of knowing certain things. And if I've given you that impression, I apologize and I confess that to you. Because this test is all about life. This is the test of living. This is the test of behavior and confession of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about what you and I do. And all too often we get so caught up in what we know that we forget about the doing. To pass this test, what does Peter say? I love verse 19. In fact, verse 19 sums up the entire book of 1 Peter. Verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. You keep on doing what God has called you to do. Keep on doing good. Don't give up and don't give in. That's how you pass the test. It's not a question of having the right answer. It is a question of having the right life. 
How are you living for God? How are you serving him? How are you sharing him? How are you giving him glory in everything that you do? How does your life reflect the gospel of Jesus Christ? You say, Pastor Mike, you know, I tried that, but man, people started getting on me. They started making fun of me. They started insulting me, and I started losing friends and and, and losing things, jobs and and influence, and the people that used to let me hang around with them don't let me do that anymore. It just got to be too hard. Listen, pass the test. Persevere in doing good. Because there will be a day when our Lord and Savior will say to you, he will say to you, you understand the price. You understand the cost. Well done good and faithful servant. This morning, as we come to a time of invitation, what is your prayer need before the Lord today? And maybe, maybe it could be that there's someone here today that just needs some encouragement. If you're here this morning, and man, you've been paying the price for calling Jesus his Lord, let us love on you. Let us encourage you and pray for you. And just know that you are not alone. Let us join our hands next to yours and our arms of support around you as we pray for the Lord to give you power and encouragement. There may be someone else here this morning that needs to start this relationship with God and and, and you're, you're reading these words from the Bible about hope and you're saying, Pastor Mike, that sounds really good. I wish I had this. Listen, you can have it. We talked last week about God's will. It's God's will that you have this hope in Jesus Christ. Won't you receive it today? Perhaps you're looking for a church home. Maybe you've been visiting Campbellsville Baptist Church for a number of weeks now. Come and be a part of us as together we seek to be that people of hope because, man, our world sure does need it. Let's pray. Father, as we come to this time of invitation, send your spirit, especially right now, descend upon us in glory and power so that anyone here today might know that they have nothing to be afraid of, certainly nothing to be ashamed of, But may they come and accept your grace and accept your open arms and your invitation to life. And this is what we can pray in the name of Jesus Christ and his glorious gospel. Amen.